Turn in your Bibles, please, to Mark chapter 12. Those of you that were in Sunday school have heard me speak a lot today. Don't tune my voice out yet. Later, maybe, but not yet. Let me begin with verse 28. It's not Luke 12, it's Mark 12. <clears throat> and one of the scribes came up and heard him disputing with one another, heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that he answered them well, asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, The most important is hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There's no other commandment greater than these. The scribe said to him, You're right, teacher. You've truly said that he is one, and there is no other besides him. And to love him with all the heart and all the understanding. There's two different words, by the way. Jesus said mind, and the, um, the um, scribe said understanding. And that's translated that way because actually he used a different word than the one Jesus said. And with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, You're not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared ask him, any more questions? <clears throat> Who's the goat? Well, in football, I think the goat just retired, right? <clears throat> I heard that word last year or two and, and in reference to sports, and it took me a while to figure out that it was an acronym for greatest of all time. Uh, so Tom Brady is the GOAT, at least in football. Uh, you might disagree with me, and that would be perfectly fine because I don't have a dog in that fight. Or you might say, who's the greatest baseball player of all time? It could go from Babe Ruth to Hank Aaron and a lot of guys in between. Or who's, who's the goat when it comes to professional basketball? Well, in my growing up, I would say it's Michael Jordan, but you might have other arguments there. Uh, in fact, the NBA um, All-Star Game was just a couple of weeks ago, and they can't even decide, and so they recognized 75 um, all-time great uh, NBA basketball players. I think it was the 75th anniversary as well of the NBA. Interest in the greatest of all is not a new thing. Go back to the time of Jesus and this religious leader comes up and to him and says, what's the greatest of all the commandments? He wants to know. He seems sincere. My translation said, what's the most important? It doesn't use the word greatest of all commandments. And Jesus didn't give him one. He gave him two. <coughs> and um, we see that in the text that I read to you from Mark. Um, but Jesus' answer says the most important is, and he starts it that way, Matthew is more specific when Matthew is dealing with this text in Matthew 22, verse 40. 
Um, Jesus says, on these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Just on those two, all the law and all the prophets. And we'll get to that in a minute as to how significant that really is. And both these commandments are grounded in the responsibility to love. First, to love God supremely, and second, to love our fellow humans genuinely. And so it's easy to outline a text like this. The first, qu the first thing is the question. The second point is the answer. <laughs> And the third point is, I don't even know what my third point is, the, the, the conclusion of the kingdom. So the question. Well, go back one line prior to verse 28, where Jesus is telling those Sadducees, he's not God of the dead, but God of the living. You are quite wrong. You're quite wrong. But then a scribe comes up and heard them disputing. This scholar, is, he's, he's standing there observing this encounter with the Sadducees that Jesus tells them they are quite wrong. I'm sure that endeared Jesus to them. But this scholar sees that he answers with some knowledge and some skill. Scribes were uh, experts in the law. And Jesus, who seemed to be educated in matters of the law, he didn't go to one of the great schools of the day, but he seemed to be educated in matters of the law, he interests the scribe who's an expert in it. And we can't be sure of his motives, but it seems that this, that for the first time, you know, we've had these the Pharisees and the Herodians and we've had the Sadducees and we've had other groups come and ask Jesus questions and try to trip him up. But it seems like this guy's sincere. His question doesn't have the, the bite of other questions that Jesus has faced. So finally, uh, it appears an honest, sincere question, nothing trying to trip Jesus up. He just wanted to see Jesus' response to this question. Why? One of the reasons is that this is a question that has been asked and discussed in Judaism for years on end. It's not an uncommon question. Which commandment is the greatest of all? Which one would you say is the greatest? Now, it's not as easy as it sounds because you and I are thinking when we hear commandment, we're thinking 10, right? So, you, you know, pick one. Which of the 10 is the greatest? Well, in the rabbinic tradition, that this guy studied, <clears throat> it had been determined that there were 613 commandments in the first five books of the Bible. Now, I'll let you go home and figure that out. <clears throat> but 613 is a lot. 365 of them are negative, and 248 of them are positive. Some were what they called light um, demands or commandments, uh, which means that the repercussion for disobedience weren't great, wasn't great. Some were considered heavy commandments, and the repercussions were severe for disobedience. In fact, Jesus seems to allude to that particular issue in Matthew 5, verse 19. He says, therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments, so there must be some that are greater if there's a least of one, 
um, and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So Jesus seems to allude to the fact that they're light and heavy ones. So this scribe is asking Jesus to declare himself on a question that's a pretty common question. They must have sat around, you know, the checkerboard from time to time, or the chessboard, just sitting around discussing, well, which one do you think is the greatest of the commandments? And Jesus, without hesitation, obliges this man. And his answer takes us to the core of what really matters in life. What's of supreme importance in this life? And so Jesus gives him the answer. In verse 29, he says, The most important is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. It's a common question. And Jesus' answer is scripture that's very familiar to any Jew that's listening to him now. This is the beginning of the Shema. The Shema is a quotation from Deuteronomy 6 that devout Jews would recite every morning and every Evening, Deuteronomy 6, verse 4 and 5. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. The scroll of that scripture, not just that scripture, but the, even a longer version of that scripture, you know, you should teach the word to your children. And all that, pass, that entire passage from Deuteronomy 6, that is the scroll that's written and put in the mezuzah. Are you familiar with the mezuzah? Have you been into a Jewish home where was, there, was, uh, there was this um, ornate um, uh, piece of, it could be plastic or wood, or, uh, the, but then they normally look really good um, on the doorpost of that home. That's the mezuzah. And inside it is a scroll that has the Shema written on it. And they recite it every day. And he says the very first sentence of that um, Shema, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now we could spend the rest of this message on the oneness of God. The Lord is one. But we won't. Um, but the oneness of God is foundational here, especially for the Jewish people, especially for you and me in the church. From the earliest days of Israel, they had to struggle with the, the, the battle between polytheism and monotheism. Polytheism being multiple gods, Monotheism being one God. The oneness of God is vitally important to Judaism and to Christianity. And that struggle continued throughout their history. It continued from, from their uh, slavery in Egypt. And Egypt had all those gods they had to struggle with. And then when Moses takes them out into the wilderness, uh, there's some, some struggles uh, with what they had been raised on there in Egypt. And here they are now in the first century under Roman, uh, Roman rule, and the Romans had their multiple gods as well. So they were always dealing with the struggle regarding the oneness of God. We talked a couple of weeks ago about the coin that Jesus said, whose image is on the coin and they said Caesar well Caesar was declared in writing on that coin that he was divine they even had to deal, deal with polytheism regarding their money that was an issue 
with Jews who are monotheistic. And so Jesus emphasizes it here when he says that you're to give God your all because God is all there is. God is one. No other deserves your devotion. Now, notice all the alls. Notice all the alls in this passage. Uh, there are four. Shall love uh, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. What part of all do you don't understand? It's easy to say, but you just think about that demand, that requirement of you. It's not, if you have a slight interest in the things of God, why don't you come and join me in my kingdom? That's not a slight interest. It's everything. If you want to know about the commandments of God, the first one is this. William Barclay says that the love that is conveyed in this command is a love which does three things. It's a love which dominates our emotions, which directs our thoughts, and which is the dynamic of all our actions. Got that? Dominates our emotions, directs our thoughts, your mind, and the dynamic of all your actions, your strength, your might, your mind. God's the object of the devotion of our heart. Love him with all your heart. The center of our whole being is to be directed toward him and toward his glory. He must come first in our ambitions. He must come first in our motives. I'm to love him with all my soul. I thought about that this week. What does that mean? Love him with all my, my, my heart. Love him with all uh, my soul. Love him in such a way that my affections and my emotions will be in tune with his will. Deep in your soul, you are in tune with the will of God. And then you continually, in that process, burn with a desire to serve him. Then I must give him my mind, my thought life. That's a hard one. Devote myself to keeping my mind pure, to have all my thinking disciplined and control. How many times do you find yourself, you're having a conversation with somebody and, and, you, and it starts out a godly conversation and then all of a sudden you're talking about politics. Our minds is just, the devil knows how to use our minds to just destroy whatever's going on in our lives at the moment. We want to have our thinking disciplined and controlled by what he's revealed in his word to us. And all my strength, all my energy, everything to the last drop of my energy, give to him. In other words, really, it's an act of your will. It's not, it's not just a sweet feeling that you might have, but it actually involves total devotion to God. I mentioned those 600 plus commandments, but let's just say we were 
talking about just the Ten Commandments. It still isn't possible to say, well, actually, I just obey the first and the greatest. But I don't deal with the other eight or nine. No, for us to be able to say that I totally commit my all, body, soul, mind, and strength means that I'm totally committed in my life to what he says about telling lies. I'm totally committed to what he says about keeping my marriage pure. I'm totally committed to not covening somebody else's stuff. And on and on and on. In other words, the outworking of this one great commandment and that partner commandment, my neighbor is myself, is not set apart from the commands of God, but is worked out in fulfilling all the other commands. In this we see what God really wants from us is love. Now, you can obey God without loving Him, but you can't love Him and not obey Him. And Jesus said this was the first of all commandments. The first commandment in regard to priority, every other act of obedience that you could do is simply empty if you don't love God first. And then the second part of his answer, he quotes Leviticus 19 verse 18. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Well, what does he mean by that? I, th I think we know what he means by that. I was going to say that. I think we know what he means by that and move on. But let me not take it for granted quite that easily. How can we love our neighbors? We use this verse during the pandemic, you know. That's why I would try to guilt everybody into wearing masks so that... Um, uh, so that they would love their neighbor. And it worked for the most part. Um, <coughs> I can't stand wearing those masks. And you know what? I don't even know if they really help. But if there's the slightest opportunity that my wearing a mask helped somebody else from not catching a virus, it might affect their lives greatly. It's, a, it's worth a little bit of discomfort, right? Love your neighbor as yourself. I don't want to get sick. Love your neighbor as yourself. It's not hard to understand, but it's hard to do. The answer lies in recognizing that God created mankind in His image, right? To love God Himself implies that we'll also love everything else which reflects Him in any way. It would be inconsistent to love Him but not love those who are made in His image. You can't do it. Don't tell me that you love God and don't show love for other people in your daily life. James used that in talking about our tongues. In James 3, 9 and 10, with it, our tongue he's talking about, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. And in the church, 
This truth, love your neighbor as yourself. Why? Because they're created in the image of God. It takes racism out of the church. It takes despising politicians who aren't in your party outside of the church. It takes, hey, I don't even like them in my party. It takes even those in your party, um, that, just politicians in general, sorry. We love our neighbor as ourselves. You don't have to like what they do or what they believe. Or just that nasty, unfriendly next door neighbor you got. You ever had one of those? I have. You cannot say you love God and not love your fellow human being. And we have a... Have you thought of this? We have a special uh, uh, motive for caring and loving others as members of the kingdom of God. The, the church has a special motive for that. We know something about them that they quite possibly don't know about themselves. And that is, they're created in the image of God. Imagine how many people don't know that about themselves. Even when that image is distorted in their lives, we love them because we see what they were meant to be and moved with compassion, hopefully. And the same is true for us. You know, you clean up pretty good. You look great today, but there are times you're unlovable as well, right? I'll leave that at that. So that's the answer. What's the conclusion to all this? Well, the scribes' response to Jesus was right on the mark, right? He reiterated everything that Jesus said. It's easy to think that religious ceremony and, 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 and devotion and work are more important than love for God and our neighbor, but that isn't the case. It's not the case at all. It's easy for us to think that, that working in the church and teaching and, and doing these things and serving on these committees are, uh, are more important than love for God and neighbor, but that's not the case. He said, look at the end of verse 33. He quotes it, love the Lord your God with all your heart and to love your neighbor as yourself is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. There's nothing you can do more important than loving God with all your heart and your neighbor as yourself. A thousand empty burnt offerings do not mean more to God than a single act of love done in His name. And when Jesus saw that He answered wisely, He said, You're not far from the kingdom of God. Oh. Close. You're close. You're not far. Well, we don't know what happened to him ultimately. Maybe we don't see him anymore in Scripture. As far as we know, maybe, maybe you'll meet him in heaven. Maybe not. But what about you? Since I've mentioned funerals today, if somebody can conduct your funeral service one day and say, she was close, just not close enough.
Is somebody going to stand here as we roll your casket down the aisle of the church and say, you know, he spent his whole life on the wooden yard line. He just never got over the goal. And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said, you're not far. You're close. You're close. We might say he, he, he could give us information as good as anybody. He, he could really teach a Sunday school lesson. He knew his Bible. He, he understood the teaching of Jesus. He, un, under, he even understood the nature of the priority of the commandments. He had it all down pat. He's just close. But when the Savior passed by saying, whoever comes to me, I won't cast out. He never called out to him. Have you ever called out to him? Have you ever called out to him and said, Jesus, be my Savior. I need a Savior. Be my Savior. It's that easy. It really is. It can't be that easy, can it, Pastor? Yep, he said so. It's easy and it's difficult. Church people, you need to hear why it's difficult. It's difficult because your sinful self keeps saying to you that you're good enough. You obey the commandments. You're a righteous person. You go to church. You give your offering. You pray. You read the Bible. See what it is that keeps you from Christ as a Savior? It's not the bad stuff that keeps you com from coming to the Savior. It's the good stuff. It's because you think you're good enough. So he doesn't need to save you. But if he doesn't need to save you, who does he need to save? Think about that. Let's pray together.